You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Marsha Butler. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a fantastic show for you today. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Jeff Sweat and his new book, Mayfly. It's actually a duology that's out now. You can join in the Mayfly Quest at mayflybook.com. Start your journey. Long ago, a mysterious plague hit the city of L.A., decimating the population. Only children were immune. Ever since, no one lives past 17, and no one knows why. There are clues all over the city. Only the most determined will recognize them, and only the cleverest will be able to solve them. Life is short. Can you outlive it? Go to mayflybook.com to join the Mayfly Quest today. And thanks to our friend Ernie Lindsay uh, for sponsoring the show. His Sarah, the complete series, uh, is on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. In Sarah, the complete series, a peaceful but hectic life is shattered for a mother and her children, along with her friends and colleagues, by kidnapping, murder, and vengeance. Those seeking retribution will go to any lengths. This bargain price collection contains over 600 pages of thrilling suspense, which includes all three novels in the Sarah series and the companion novella. Sarah, the complete series by Ernie Lindsay. Now stay tuned for the show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Marsha Butler on the show with me today. And Marsha and I have already been laughing, so I know that this is going to be a great show for you today. Marsha has a brand new book out. When you're hearing this, it'll be available everywhere. It's called Pickles Progress, and it's a fantastic book, guys. I know you're going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, Marsha. Thank you, Hank. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Mm, That's interesting. Well, I came to writing relatively late in my long career of doing other things, and um, I guess it was when I originally when I became uh, when I started writing blogs for an interior design blog I used to be an interior designer and um, I started a blog I had not written before and I wrote blogs and people had a very positive reaction to them and I kind of got a glimmer of of a, a thing that I I could write you know I actually could write yeah, not 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 in an exalted way of course at that time uh, this was about 10 years ago, but it really planted a seed of uh, this feeling that I wanted to express in words what I'd previously been expressing through music because I was a professional musician and then in design. So it was the next iteration of, um, you know, expression through another art form. So it was about, I guess about 10 years ago, I kind of I kind of understood something about myself that I had not known before, which was that I could write in some fashion. I love the idea of people pursuing multiple artistic forms and expressions. Um, and one thing that I love to ask people is, uh, do you feel like being a professional musician uh, and then being um, a, a decorator, which is a, a different kind of art form, uh, mm-hmm. do you feel like those two pursuits, and, and maybe more, you tell me if, if there have been other things that you've um, dug into, uh, do you feel like those things have informed the way you write, the way you see the world and then tell people about the world that you see? Yes, and not specifically so, but in a in a more generalized global way. Um, I think I was a professional oboist for 30 years in New York City. And then I was an interior designer for 15 years. And those pr- occupations um, uh, overlap for about five years. But to get to the point of your question, um, I think being in two art forms, which require a tremendous amount of, you know, high level performance, so to speak, um, set a stage 
for me to enter writing knowing that I, I had to bring um, exactitude and excellence and, you know, sort of never being satisfied with the finished product to the table for being a writer. So it set up kind of a general uh, sense of aesthetic correctness in music and in, and in design, you know, which have obviously, you know, are two different art forms, but basically all art forms are storytelling, you know, in a way. And so uh, there was, you know, I was, a um, I was a, a, a pro at two, art forms that required excellence at the highest level. And that sort of, you know, that was on the table completely when I became a writer. Um, You know, the bar was high from within myself. You know, see, I sort of knew this is not good and this is a little bit better, (laughs) (laughs) which happens all the time in writing, you know. (laughs) And then it it goes back to not being good. Right. (laughs) Um, when did you start playing music? Oh, gosh. I uh, play, started in, uh, you know, grade school. I started playing the flute, and then in seventh grade I began the oboe, and, you know, that kind of set me on a path of it, it really, you know, just t- I took to it. It kind of, music kind of saved my life, and um, I pursued it all, you know, went to a music conservatory and continued here as a freelancer in New York City and had a successful career doing it. Um but it's 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 really the template for everything that happened and you know that I was able to do later on in life also which is being a musician we talked about how the art forms inform each other um but what are what are some of the differences uh in in how you prepare to be a musician. I I know lots of people spend a lifetime uh, preparing and then staying in practice and then staying uh, in, in performance shape and, um, uh, and all of this stuff. And, and writing is one of these things that, um, that anyone can do. uh, Although we know a lifetime of practice means doing it well. Um, How, how do these, these two pursuits, um, how do you see them as different and do they, Do they come from a different place inside you? Mm. Well, I think that all expression fundamentally comes from a lens uh, in your mind and in your heart, which is the prism of your own personal psychology and upbringing and experience of being an artist in the world. So I think that's a global thing of how the arts, people who do different arts in their art, in their lifetime, how it all resonates. It's all coming from our brain, you know, and um, and our our psychology. But I think that what is beautiful for me about writing now is, is that it's it's singular. In other words, I'm the only one doing it with the exception of showing my work to readers and editors. But essentially, there's no one else involved in the output of my story, my fiction, my book, you know, anything that I write. It comes solely from me. That's not the case with music. And in for music, yes, you're spending thousands and thousands and thousands and countless hours throughout your lifetime maintaining, perfecting, reaching new levels all the time, because as a musician, you're never, you know, you're never the final artist at any given time. You are constantly searching through new music and also just the, you know, the effort to become a better musician, a better technician, a better musician, which never ends because we're all searching for that wonderful alchemy that happens in music, concert to concert to concert. But there is a lot of input and collaboration in music after you step away from the practice room. So when you go into a rehearsal situation, whether it's in an orchestra or chamber music, and I'll take chamber music as an example, say it's a a group of eight people going to rehearse uh, for a performance, and you have four, three or four rehearsals to do it, everybody talks, everybody brings in their ideas, everything is on the table as to how you're going to render that piece in a way that is the composite expression of all eight people. So I might come in and have practiced it a lot 
and thought, you know, well, I'm, I feel like I want to do this here or do that here or make this louder, that softer. And you bring it to the table and there has to be a consensus that that, that will work for everyone. And so there's a lot of chatter going on throughout the process. Your ideas fall into the floor or they, they float and they take, uh, they take um, on uh, resonance for other people. Ultimately, the most important thing in music is that the music gets its rendering in the best way, not that the ego of certain person has his way or her way. So in terms of orchestral playing, you know, and in general, you walk out on stage for the performance and there's a sense of no one can talk now. It's just the playing and there's a relief in that. You know, so that it gets it finally all the everyone becomes silent and can only play. And in interior design, of course, there's collaboration with the client, which is a completely different experience because you're creating an environment for someone else. And so you bring things to the table and then everything gets shuffled around depending on what the client likes, what the vision of the client is. And then all along the way, you're trying to uh, enlighten, teach you know, cajole the client into an aesthetic that they may not be aware is even possible. So it's a very tender and, you know, um, it's an honored profession that you're, you're creating an environment for someone that is, um, you know, is the way that they're going to live their life in a better way, hopefully. Right. Um, I love the idea of alchemy uh, as as the 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 thing that happens when uh, when when we uh, combine our craft. It, it becomes a different thing. Um, I I, uh, I like to think that writing can be a bit of alchemy as well. In that something else happens when someone reads what we've written, and there becomes a relationship between writer and reader. Um, that is that's overlooked a lot of times I think uh, because writing is such a solitary thing and we spend uh, a lot of times months and years working on something and 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 making sure that the right emotion comes across and that we are we are truly carrying um, the the reader to another place um, but until someone reads that it's just potential energy sitting there um, it's it's the act of someone then engaging with what we've written. That, that kind of kicks off the alchemical process, I think. And uh, so the, the, the more different we see things, really the more the same they are. Oh, that's such a great, I wish I could just, you know, can what you just said. It's so perfect because I agree with you. You know, the act of art, art in whatever art is kind of a, like I see it as it's, it's a, it's a transaction, really. It's a it kind of, I, I, I don't mean to put this word in here, but I haven't really been able to find a different word, but it's co- kind of a moral transaction where the artist is making this thing. The thing comes into the world, say the book, it's laying there. And then it's meant to be received by someone you don't know and to be interpreted in the way that that person will come to it with its own that person's own psychology. So there's the alchemy in everything that you've put into the book. The book is there to be read and you have no idea whether how someone is going to to interpret it. And I've had this experience with my novel Pickles Progress in a very profound way in that early readers um it, my my book is uh, as we are taping this is out in about a week and a half. But early readers have come back and said, well, the book's about this. The book's about love. The book is about, um, you know, any number of things. And I had not seen it that way. And, of course, this is all just grist for the mill. But it's, it's kind of this transaction that is beautiful for the writer. Because once it's read by many people, well, the book is expanded in an exceptional way. And that's exactly what it's meant to do is to enter the mind of a reader and then be digested in a way and, and experienced in that reader's life, which is different from every reader's life. And so this is the profound quality of, of writing and 
not knowing and being comfortable of, with the not knowing about what is going to happen to your book. Right. Well, it, it's one reason that I, I ask people um, a lot of times kind of the origins of a book, what was going on when that uh, that kicked off. Uh, you know, the, the inspiration for a book, but we rarely talk about what the book is supposed to mean to people. Um, because when someone reads it, it, it takes on a life of its own. And, and a lot of times, I would think probably more times than not, the, the book for the reader becomes something that the writer never even intended. And, uh, and, and it becomes, this third thing, it, it's, it, it stops being what the writer intended, um, and uh, it, it stops being what the what the reader brought from it, and it becomes this this third entity that's uh, that's kind of magical. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of wonderful that you say it's the third entity because three is the number which is um, makes uh, everything like a, a like. Um, you know, there's three blind mice. Threes are everywhere. You know, three blind mice, three stooges. The um, the power of three in music is that when two violins play together, it sounds kind of bad. If you add a third, it sounds exponentially better than three, simply because of how everything is resonating. So this idea that you, you've just um, articulated of a third way that, that something – it, it just takes off in a way that is much bigger than the writer and the book, exactly. which is the duality. And then it just expands, which is kind of woo woo. But of course, this is what this is. This is why, you know, art is in the world is just to kind of hopefully expand everyone's universe and just kind of have this empathetic, uh, you know, transaction going on. Well, and this is the place that we get to talk about woo woo uh, without people looking at us funny because everyone that's listening to this is nodding their head like, yes, I totally get that. I totally get that. I hope so. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so tell us what you mentioned that it was about 10 years ago that writing really uh, came onto your radar or, you know, um, became a thing that you wanted to pursue. What was that initial, um, idea or, uh, what was the initial prodding? What was it that made it, uh, become something that you needed to do? Well, as I said, I started with this design blog and I was talking about, of course, red couch, blue couch, where do you get your lighting and things like that. But I also started writing about um, aspects of creativity and, um, you know, more global, uh, sort of trying to inform my clients about what was in my head you know, um, that was deeper than the transaction that we ha and the transactions that we would have in the space for their space. And it also clearly became, um, you know, an outlet for me to actually articulate these things that I've been thinking out f about for a long time. But very shortly, I also began writing about things about my childhood, things that had happened and trying to get down on paper you know, how did this thing of music happen to me and then ultimately design? But I ended up writing a memoir, which was published two years ago, called The Skin Above My Knee. And that just, I got on a train of writing this thing and it really, really never stopped. And so over a course of five, four or five years, I wrote that memoir and managed to get it published. And during, it was I never thought it would get published, but I knew that I was in the humblest way a writer and I wanted to I wanted to write fiction too. So once the memoir was out, I turned over in bed and started writing Pickle's Progress. Um I didn't want to stop and I was eager e I was eager to get out of the narrative of my own life actually. And so I immediately started writing Pickle and um that was freeing in its own way. And uh, I could uh, all of a sudden write from a completely a, a complete imagination. You know, what would this guy do? Pickle, Pickle McCardle, who's the protagonist in my book, what was he going to do today? And what was he going to do tomorrow? And um, I could just, you know, pull out all the stops for this <laughs> poor guy uh, who struggles. And um, so that's kind of how it happened. It it's the weirdest kind of addiction. It's uh, something that, that a lot of people never 
Um, I, I think a lot of people think about writing, uh, but for someone to actually take the jump and to do it and then to finish something, um, you, you, you hear people that, that say, I, I just want to write a book. I think I have a book in me. Uh, no one ever just writes a book. Now, they may only publish one book, um, but you know it's it's once the faucet is opened it's uh it's like trying to put all the toothpaste back in the tube it's just not going to happen absolutely and you know it's um you know it's hard work it's lonely work um it is the hardest work i've ever done including being a musician my and musician is a very incredibly exacting profession especially as an oboist it's it's just one of the hardest instruments ever but well, and, and it, it cuts through the mix like uh, like rare other instruments do. Uh, like if if you're not on your game, you know it. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, and you know you have to be ready constantly. I mean, it's just it's just yeoman's work, and it is the solo instrument of the orchestra of the wind section, really. Um, if I may so humbly say, excuse me, <laughs> flutist, clarinetist, and bassoonist, but it is. And um, you know, but the thing about writing is. In this solitude, in these hours that you sit and struggle and cut words and throw things out, there are those moments where, you know, you're channeling. It's the the protagonist or the whatever the passage is that you're writing. It's just flowing and you know what the next sentence should be and you know where this whole scene is going on a level that is not exactly conscious it's it's working consciously and unconsciously and when those moments happen and every author who might listen to this podcast knows what i'm talking about those are the moments that you just you want to open yourself up to that every single day it doesn't happen always it doesn't happen daily but it's there for the grabbing and those are very very precious times in writing and it's all yours. It's only yours. It's no one else. No one else has suggested anything. No one's in the room talking to you. No one's telling you go this way, that way. It's all your own consciousness telling you this is right. It's going and just step out of the way. Uh, wonderfully said. Um, let You mentioned Pickle, and after writing the memoir that um, uh, that that Pickle came to you, and you, you needed to know what was happening next in his life, um, where did Pickle come from? Well, Pickle is an identi- uh, is the protagonist, Pickle McArdle. He's an identical twin in the novel. His brother is Stan McArdle. So the idea for this book came from two places. Um, one is something that fell away completely. Uh, immediately. And one was something that resonates and actually got on the page uh, throughout the novel. I knew two women uh, years ago. I still know uh, one of them. She's a, she's a friend. She's a musician, actually, both of them were. They were identical twins. And I met this one woman um, back in the early 80s, in the beginning of my professional life here in New York City. Her twin, they are identical even as adults, and they still are very hard to tell them apart, although I can because I've known them for years. But this one woman said to me back in the day, she said, you know, I've been uh, her boyfriend had asked her to marry her. He was a musician, too. And she said, you know, I just worry that he's attracted to my sister. And I said, well, why didn't you ask him? (laughs) You know, and she did. And he said, no, 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 never, 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 never. And she was great relieved. They got married and they're still married and they're just a delightful couple. But at the time, I didn't believe him. Right. You know, she she came back to me and she said, yeah, Carl's all good. You know, it's going to be fine. And she said she he wasn't attracted to her sister. And I just so suspicious. And. Okay, so cut to the chase 40 years later, I'm writing this novel, and I'm thinking about identical twins in that situation. And it set up this, this idea, this template for um, what I wanted to explore in the book, which was attraction, which was, how does that work? Now, everybody's attracted, of course, from sight, immediately, there's either a sizzle or there's not, completely. And then, of course, as you get to know the person, 
the person's essence is either attractive or not. So the person could be drop dead handsome, but could be a creep underneath or even a per- or not such a bad creep, but someone who just doesn't resonate for you. Like this is not going to work out. So pickle is, you know, is attracted to someone in the book for life and is his true soulmate. And he's also attracted to someone who he idealizes as the beauty that just shimmers within him. So the book is about attraction. And through that attraction, Pickle behaves in a very reckless manner throughout the book. And he's not even sure who he wants to, you know, really land upon metaphorically in the book. The other thing that inspired me for this book, which fell away completely, was a story that happened a couple of years ago here in New York City, where a couple uh, went onto the George Washington Bridge in the middle, middle of the night. They were from Staten Island, and it made the news, and they jumped off to commit suicide. And they were picked up alive, but died quickly after. I was interested in exploring, initially in the book, what makes, how do two people get to a point simultaneously that they both decide to jump to their deaths? And so the beginning of the novel starts with someone jumping to his death on the George Washington Bridge, leaving his girlfriend on the bridge. Um, but the plan was to jump together. That particular scenario does not, does not take off in the, in the book. But it was it was something that I was thinking about writing is how do people decide this? Well, and it almost sets the tone for uh, for Pickle's trajectory and in this kind of strange um, we're we're um, we're started with this kind of dissonant resonant note at the beginning of the of the book that that kind of sets us on nerve. Uh, is as the book unfolded, knowing that you started the book that way, does that uh, begin to inform kind of how we feel about Pickle? Well, yes, because Pickle comes to the rescue and P- Pickle meets this woman who's left on the bridge who is traumatized. And she becomes uh, his object of desire. and uh, Almost an obsession. An obsession and kind of a fantasy because he never really sees who she is fully. We know from other aspects in the book of how I flesh out, hopefully, in a way that informs this particular woman's trauma and how she's living that trauma. But Pickle never goes quite deep enough to understand that in her. So she very much be, stays a surface attraction for him, although he goes after her with all, you know, bells and whistles. And so I think there's this, um, you know, duality living in pickle of this woman who he idealizes and is going to bring out of her tragedy and then a woman that he actually loves deeply, but can't really, really get. So um, this is a dichotomy that I, is working through in the book. And um, Pickle's a mess, you know, around the whole thing. He is a complete train wreck. And, he, you know, it just um, it just plays out, hopefully, in a, in a way that makes people turn the page. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and not just Pickle, um, but Pickle's family. The we, um, uh, you know, we meet his twin brother, Stan uh, and and Karen, and they are, um, you know, very successful, very, uh, you know, they have the well appointed home, all that. But they're drunk and driving and, and Pickle comes uh, to uh, to the rescue, kind of when when all of this unfolds on the George Washington Bridge, um, which which lends another layer uh, to Pickle and to the whole story, um, because we see that that Pickle didn't wind up this way in a vacuum. Uh, there are there are more layers of complexity. 
Exactly. And, you know, uh, you're, you're, thank you for not, not doing, uh, you know, you're not giving away certain plot points here <laughs> because you really discover them along the way. Right. But one of the other things, and I can say this, is that, you know, the thing that intrigued me is nature nurture for twins. You know, of course, identical twins, you know, it's been well documented that there is a connection, there is a synergy between these people who were born, you know, seconds apart from each other, twinship um, for identical twins. And I'm sure for uh, the other type of twin, it exists. But particularly for identical twins, there is always a connection. And Pickle and Stan do have this. They are bound together for life. And yet, the mother has treated them completely differently. She's raised the twins she has favored one twin over the other in damage, very damaging ways. And how that plays out in the twin's life, the resentments that are built up because of it, and also setting it aside, you know, to uh, that each twin has, a, has an empathy for the other. One twin floats up, one f- twin doesn't. And they are constantly... Uh, unconsciously, I think, managing that through their lives of when that reality pops out for both of them and they both have to realize, wow, the other twin didn't have it so so well. And um, one twin did very well. And the mother is in the middle of them because the mother destroyed one twin and helped another twin. And in that doing that very thing, destroyed them both actually <laughs> dun, dun, dun. yeah um, <laughs> thank you for that i needed yeah, that yeah, yeah right right um when you begin writing a book um especially a character driven book like this um genre does not always come into the writer's uh, mind and thought process um this book is is really interesting to me. I, I know Amazon has it listed uh, as literary fiction, and eh, I think that's that's a little vague. Um, there are definite tones of um, of like psychological thriller, suspense, um, uh, family drama. There, there's there, this this is a a multi note um, uh, book. How would you describe it to people? Um, what what is the the tone that you set this that you think this book sets to people? Right. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, literary fiction, uh, you know, it's flattering. Um, but that's I, kind of a weird umbrella. It yeah. is a weird umbrella, and um, I would say that the uh, the category would be upmarket contemporary fiction. The book is set in Manhattan. It. It plays out in a really fast timeline over five weeks, right? And New York City is the backdrop, right? We, the, the characters take us to the cloisters, the Flatiron Building, the Lipstick Building where Madoff had his company, um, you know, all over New York City. Architecture and art is, is the pulse underneath. So it, it, it takes on kind of a very visual uh, aspect, and we can see our char- the characters moving around. There's a little bit of a noir feeling to it. Um, there is definitely psych- psychological drama, you know, you know, very vivid scenes that happen, and I hope that it's very um, tactile and sensory driven, um, and. My, I think I was just unconsciously, because it is my debut novel, just trying to get into these people's brains, really, of how what they're seeing, smelling, touching, feeling. Um, and so it, it's, it's psychological drama, yes, and, you know, kind of dark. It's dark, and yet it, humor is also very, very present. Because in their dialogue, they they speak in very humorous ways, or what I hope um, is very humorous way. Um, but it's a it's a New York story, which has broad psychological implications. I think. 
That it does. That it does. Uh, the new book, Pickles Progress, is on sale everywhere when you're hearing this. Um, Marcia, I'm excited to hear from readers when they read the book to hear what that alchemical process brings about for them. Um, and we're going to look for comments on the show to hear what people think about it. Um, if people are just discovering you and your work and want to know more about you and follow along with what's coming up, uh, where can people find you online? Well, I'm on social media. Um, they can follow me on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. And it's basically Marsha Butler or Marsha A. Butler. Um, and I have a website, um, which is Marsha Butler com. The other thing that I wanted to say just um, – as an addendum is, is that I'm making it, I'm making a documentary film, which is being released in New York city on June 9th. It's called the creative imperative. And, uh, it, it's where I dis- I'm fleshing out the essence of creativity and being an artist in the world. I interview musicians, dancers, actors, artists, and writers, and ask them three questions, which distills, uh, helps them distill, this uh, idea of creativity and being an artist in the world, and and they tell their stories about it. And um, I'm very excited about that. Um, so that's coming out in June. Well, well, I saw that on your website, and it looks phenomenal. Um, is this going to go to a wider audience after the debut? To be determined. Um, I'll try to find distribution, but I have some wheels in motion. Right now it has one performance, and it's going to be submitted to documentary film, uh, you know, festivals, film festivals and so forth. But, um, you know, I hope it'll get wide distribution, but step at a time. Right now it's a vanity project. (laughs) Well, well, please keep us updated. Email me and and, and let me know if it does, because uh, I would love to, uh, to promote that and let everybody know that is right down the alley of what this podcast is all about. Great. I'd be thrilled so, to do that. Yeah, Hank, thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to send everybody to MarshaButlerAuthor.com, uh, and we're going to put links to the new book and everything you do in the show notes of this uh, podcast. Marsha, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. It has been a joy, Hank. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Seven men ran the farce. The seven witch hunters. The court of Oyer and Terminer. They tortured and lied and mutilated and murdered. They knew those women up in Salem Village were no witches. Their true target was the coven hidden in their own midst here in Salem Town. They meant to hang the innocent until the sisters surrendered. Did they surrender? said Jason. No. Was that the wrong decision? To let innocent women die and save themselves? What do you think? Should the coven have fought openly? Created more hysteria by swooping in on broomsticks and casting spells over Salem? Should they have killed the judges? There are no right decisions. That is the horror of a witch hunt. Everything you do condemns you. Question the judge, thou art a defiant witch. Question his laws, you question the king, and thou art a treasonous witch. Question his superstitions, you question scripture, and thou art a blasphemous witch. Pity the condemned, you pity witches, and thy Christian mercy proves thy collusion with Satan. Witch hunters are not just bad lawyers practicing bad law. They are men who place the ends before the means. They choose their victim, a man, a woman, an entire race, and mark them for extinction. All evidence is damning evidence. All associations are damning associations. All infractions. And who among us is without sin? Are unforgivable infractions. Their own failings and abuses of power are shrugged away as mere vigor in pursuit of the public good. A witch hunter will have you by whatever means necessary. If he cannot find evidence, he will create evidence. He will entrap you and question you and distort what you say. He will walk you through the night until your feet bleed, strip you and stripe you, dress you in your own filth until you forget you are human. 
he will torture your friends until they betray you. And if anyone dares to weep at your hanging, he will drag them to Gallows Hill in the back of the next ox cart. Any man can be a witch hunter. All it takes is hatred and arrogance, and the preening self-regard that proclaims, my deeds are always good because they are my deeds. The seven judges of the Salem court were such men. But one witch stood up to them. She stood up to centuries of unchallenged, murderous dogma and pronounced the magic word, no. They burned her for it.